Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about DB scan or density based spatial clustering of applications with noise. While it sounds like a heavy name, it's actually very simple to understand and yet very powerful because it overcomes some of the opportunities that we saw with the earlier clustering techniques. For example, DB scan is completely robust to the outliers. It very smartly eliminates the outliers while doing proper clustering. So let's get started. So let's say we have some points in a multi-dimensional space. Let's take this point for instance. If we draw a circle of a certain radius around this point, like this, can we find out how many points are there within this radius or at least intersecting the radius? So we see there are in total four points, including this point itself. A point which satisfies having certain number of minimum points around it is called a core point. So I repeat, the two things we need to check for every point, when we draw a circle of a certain radius, which will be passed by us, does the circle contain certain number of minimum points? If the radius is drawn and the points are there, then it is called a core point. Remember, these are the minimum number of points. Let's say we set that value to four. So in this case, that's satisfied. But if there were seven or eight points, that will again be satisfied because we are saying minimum four points should be there. If there are more than four, that's not a problem. That actually confirms that we have a higher density. And as such, this is a density-based approach. Two important terms to remember. Epsilon, which represents the radius of the circle, and minimum points, which is the minimum number of points in the circle. These inputs will be provided by the user conducting the experiment. And we can always try out different values to attain better clusters. Now let's concentrate on this point. So when we draw a circle of the same radius epsilon here, do we have four points? In this circle, we have one, two, and three points. So we cannot say this is a core point. A core point needs to satisfy both the conditions. A core point needs to satisfy the condition of minimum point. But this point here is the neighbor of a core point. So such points are called boundary points. We have a core point, we have a boundary point. What about this point? This is neither a neighbor to a core point, nor it's a core point in itself because it does not satisfy the condition of minimum points. Remember the difference. This point is also not a core point, but it is still a neighbor of a core point. So it's called a boundary point. This point is neither the neighbor of a core point, nor itself is a core point. So this point is called an outlier. So we have a core point, a border point, and an outlier. If you've understood this much, then we can move to the next step which will be dealing with a relatively larger data. Now, the step one in DB scan is to identify all the core points. We have to identify all such points when a circle of this radius is drawn, contain at least four neighbors. This four is a number of our choice. We can always change it. It doesn't have to be four. It, it could be three, it could be five, it could be any other number. But if you keep it as one, it simply means that this point is alone and that does not help. So we'll not choose it as one. Choosing it two is not common. Typically, we choose it at least as three. Now, we are going to identify all the core points in our data. Is this a core point? Yes. When you draw the circle, we have four points, counting this particular point as well. What about the next one? So looking at this point, this has five points within the circle. We said minimum four. This has five. That's better. Nothing wrong. Likewise, this point is again a core point because if we draw the circle, it satisfies having four points. This point is again a core point. And now you can imagine we can mark all the core points like this. The first thing we have to do is all the core points have to be identified separately. So let's assign them one color. Let's say we've given them this orange color. So all these core points have been identified. As of now, we see the core points identified with the orange color, the green points, which are not the core points, and one outlier that we've already marked. There may be more outliers we'll figure out. The step two is to bring the neighbors of the core points to the same groups so that this group further grows. So let's start with this point. Is this a core point? Of course not. Is this the neighbor of a core point? Yes, it's actually a neighbor of two core points, this point as well as this point. So we'll give it the same color. What about this point? This point is not a core point because it, it does not contain four points, but it's definitely the neighbor of a core point. So we'll again color it. What about this point? It again is the neighbor of a core point, though it's not a core point in itself, right? Likewise, this point, is this a core point? It's not a core point, but it's a neighbor of a core point. So we color this accordingly. Is this a core point? 
we can consider the cases which are somewhere inside the boundary as well as the neighbors. So we'll still consider this point. And let's say this is again treated as a neighbor of a core point. What about this point? This again is the neighbor. So you see, first we assigned all the core points and now we're joining all the neighbors of the core points. What about these points here? Is this point a core point? No. Is this a neighbor? Not even a neighbor to a core point. So this is an outlier. Likewise, is this point a core point? No. Is this the neighbor of a core point? This is touching on the outer edge, so we can discount this and we will treat this again as an outlier. Similarly, this point is different from the rest of the data. Of course, does not have a neighbor, nor it's a core point. And what about these two points here? These are core points, but are these similar to these points that we have? Well, actually they seem far. Why? Because they are not connected in any way. They are just core points, but they are not connected to this group that we have formed here. So maybe we need to identify them as four points, but not with the same color. We give it a different color. Now, once again, for these four points, do we have neighbors? Yes, this is a neighbor, this is a neighbor, and this is a neighbor. Let's assign them all the same color. So effectively, if you see, we have found one cluster with these many points, one cluster with these points here, and the shape is a little unusual. And then you have these outliers. So in a way, you can imagine that we have nicely derived our cluster labels, parking the outliers aside. This is dbscan and is known to work very well for the kind of data sets which are very difficult to be clustered with the k-means and other classic techniques. For example, if your data set is like this, so kind of if you see it's a peculiar shape here that you see, it's more of a nested structure of the data. Even for such data set, dbscan is known to work pretty well. Even more complex, if the data set is something which is co-centric, so you have one circular arrangement here, plus the larger surroundings, which are again circular in nature. For these kind of data sets, the conventional approaches to clustering often fail to do justice, whereas dbscan pretty much works. All right, so we are once again at the Google Collaboratory, and I'm going to show you the hands-on example for dbscan. We have covered the entire theory piece in the previous video. In terms of preparedness, we've already pointed to the data source, which is known as the housing data, and we are going to work on this data from here on. We begin by calling the basic libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. And we are also importing warnings just in case we get warnings related to some packages being updated. So we're running this code and it's executed. Now we begin by reading our data. So we are storing it by the name of DF, which is a short form for data frame. And we are reading the same housing data that we already have loaded. Let's inspect the first few observations of this data, which will be inspected using the head command. And we can see this data set has various variables. Actually, these kind of data sets are quite popular for regression problems, but we are just trying to see if we can somehow find some patterns within the data where we can club the houses which are similar in certain aspects. So we have features like the average number of bedrooms, the population of the region, the house price, the median income of the locality, the average occupancy, the average number of rooms, and how old is the property. This actually is a supervised learning data set which has the target column as the house price. But for our purpose, we are going to drop it because we are interested in unsupervised learning and we don't need to make a prediction here. If we quickly check the info of the data just to understand the dimensions, the data type, and if there are null values, looks like we don't have missing values because all the cells are occupied and it says uh, these are non-null. We have 1,214 rows and seven features and the data types are consistently floats, numerical values with decimal. Let's check if we have any duplicate row in the data because we don't have a specific row identifier here. And now we'll have to check it on the entire data. So we're just running that check. We don't have any duplicate row in this data. Now, as I said, because we are doing clustering, which is unsupervised learning, we will drop the target column, which is house price. We don't want to predict the price in this exercise. I'm storing another copy of the data as DF plus, which is data frame for clustering purposes, where we are removing this column. Let's just run this. So that being executed, we can now quickly visualize the data. We can try to identify if we have outliers in it in the data, and we are doing that with the help of a box plot. We are taking all the variables, we're going over the collection of all the variables, and we are plotting each variable one at a time through a box plot. Let's see how we get this output. So we can see variables like population, house price, median income, average, occupancy, have outliers. Why is this house price showing up again here? Because here we visualize the original data frame. If I reduce it to DF plus, 
and I run it again, this house price column would not be visible. Yeah, so the house price is gone. Now you only can see the population, median income, average occupancy, and these three columns have outliers. So we have a total of six columns of which half the columns have outliers. Now, you might have seen in the earlier videos, we've always treated the outliers in some or the other way. But for DB scan, we don't really have to do that because it is capable of taking care of the outliers on its own. Let's proceed with the next steps. While we do not need to treat the outliers, remember, there is a metric called epsilon, which is nothing but the distance from the core point. So even DB scan uses a distance metric. And that's why we have to scale the data. Now comes a dilemma. The common scaling techniques that you know, which are min-max scalar and standard scalar, they're affected by the presence of outliers. We have outliers, which we don't want to treat, and we also want to scale. So what is the way out? We'll use something called as a robust scalar. It's available in the same library, scikit-learn pre-processing, but this does its scaling based on the interquartile range. So it is not affected by the outliers. A very important point, when you have outliers present in the data, you should avoid using standard scalar or min-max scalar. Because if you study their calculations, they are affected by the outliers. So we are using robust scalar, exact same kind of syntax. Whenever you apply this, it's going to transform the data into an array. So we are restoring it back to a data frame format. So we are doing a fit transform together on the entire data, maintaining the names of the features because arrays would typically not have features, storing it as a data frame. Let's run this. Let's see if the data has actually been scaled. So yes, now the features look fairly range bound and comparable. And the next step, we will perform DB scan. So syntax is pretty straightforward. We have to just import DB scan from sklearn cluster. And here, while instantiating DB scan, we need to pass these two hyperparameters. Now, this default value for epsilon is 0.5, and min samples is something which we'll be choosing based on the data. Generally, the recommendation for min samples is that we can keep it as the number of features plus one or twice the number of features. So, for example, if we have five features, or six features, we can keep it as 12, or we can keep it as number of features plus one, which will be seven. But that's not guaranteed to be the best solution for you. So you'll have to experiment with a few more values here. And we found that this value of 20 was reasonable. Similarly, you can experiment with the values of epsilon as well. If you increase this, you'll be looking at a larger radius and you can expect more points to be accommodated. There is no one right or wrong starting point for these. You just have to experiment with a few values and find out what works best for you. So once we instantiated it, we have to fit our scale data through it. And this would have an attribute called labels, which will help us store the labels to our data frame. Just check how many labels are we generating. So we can check that with the help of this np.unique. NumPy's unique method tells us how many unique labels have been generated. Let's run this. So we've been able to generate four labels looks like. But the interesting piece is that the label minus one that you see here is basically not a label. It is DB scans way of representing outliers. So see, without us pointing to outliers, we just did a high level check for outliers. We never treated them. DB scan is smartly able to identify that we have such houses listed, which seem to be different from the rest of the houses. And that's why they're marked as outliers. And then we have three clusters, zero, one, and two. Let's store these cluster labels to the cluster data frame. And we are storing it to the unscaled one right now because unscaled one will be a little more interpretable. That's how the original variables were, right? So scaled input was given just to DB scan. For interpretation, we'll use the unscaled version only. Let's do that. And let's check the cluster sizes. How many observations have gone into each of these clusters? For this, we can do a value counts on the column. So you can see we found 52 outliers in our data. We have cluster zero, which has 380 houses. Cluster one has 250 properties and cluster two has 532 properties. Let's remove the outliers from the data because we don't want to be interpreting the outliers. So what we're doing is that we are just taking a final cut from the overall data, which will no longer contain. So this exclamation and equal to represents not equal to minus one. So we're filtering out the cluster label minus one from our data. And for the rest of the observations, we can simply do a group by on the DB scan labels. And now we can interpret this, right? So let's see this. So cluster label zero, if you see, can I say these are the oldest properties? Because their median house age, why did we take a median? Because we had outliers in the data. So the median house age of these properties is relatively higher compared to the rest of the data. Average occupancy is also pretty high. These are old properties, which are pretty much occupied. And they seem to be in the most populous region as well. So this is again different for this cluster. This 
cluster has a high population density. Originally, this data was captured using the blocks. This data was captured as an average representation for a block. Block is a small geographical unit. So it's not just one house. It could be an average representation of multiple houses in the region. And that's why here it says it's a populous region. It's the old property and has higher occupants. What about cluster one? It somewhere falls in between in most of the categories that you see. So it's, it's the lowest on the average number of bedrooms, but these are pretty close, so we can't differentiate. Population-wise, it's, it's definitely in between. In terms of median income of the people in that region, this is the lowest compared to other categories. In terms of the average occupancy, it's in the middle. In terms of average number of rooms, it's again in the middle. And in terms of house age, it's again in the middle. So it's somewhere in between. It's not very new properties. It's not extremely old properties, but, but these properties are not located in the regions which are as densely populated as it is for cluster zero. And what about cluster two? Well, these seem to be somewhat different properties. Why? Because these are the newest properties. Their average rooms are quite high. So these could also be commercial properties like hotels or resorts. Even the average bedrooms that you see are relatively very high compared to the rest of the categories. So these are basically large properties which are new establishments. And if you talk about the median income, that seems to be the highest here. So the localities where these properties are present are affluent. So this way we can somewhat categorize the properties of the clusters, do the profiling and accordingly work on the clusters here. Hope you got clarity on dbscan. It's not that complicated as the name sounds and it's actually a very powerful technique when it comes to treating outliers. Thank you for your time.